Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Shell Talks with Dasha, where we take a deep dive into the world of tech news, startups, innovations, and venture capital. As your host, I'll be your guide on this exciting journey. Together, we'll uncover the latest trends, explore groundbreaking ideas, and interview industry leaders. My name is Dasha. Let's get started. And the topic of our discussion today is mastering community building. From passion to startup founder, the story of BASE. And I'm super excited to introduce Natalia, a co-founder of BASE, a membership club that brings great minds together for curated social experiences, a co-founder of the Miami Tech Happy Hour, a great community builder, networker, party maker, keep going, keep going, and just a wonderful person. Hi, Natalia. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. And yes, I'm a big gatherer. That's probably my number one <laughs> thing like if i have to go by one title it's probably just like a gatherer <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. That, that's actually a very nice one you know gatherer i haven't even thought of that <laughs> i'm sure like that's it. not the appropriate use of that but i'm gonna co-opt it and keep going <laughs> <laughs> okay so natalia a gatherer but so before diving deeper into your professional gathering achievement and career journey you know i like to ask you about your personal story of course of so course. As an immigrant with Cuban and Russian roots, proficient in English, Russian, Spanish, any other languages? No. no. <laughs> By any Very, I would say travel French, but that's it. <laughs> well, oh, that's nice. Okay. So do you believe this mix of cultures has influenced your, you know, career path and love of gathering people? Well, so for me, I would say yes, 100%. And I think it's the influence of that is different for everybody, right? Like immigrants, yeah. you know, the immigrant experience is so varied and so colorful. People immigrate by need, people immigrate by choice, you know, like you immigrate at different stages of your life. Yeah. So I, I do think that the, the immigrant journey is definitely multi-tracked and the effect, uh, the kind of the impact that that has on, a, on anyone personally and professionally, I think can be very varied. For me, I would say the the biggest element of that is that I'm an only child. My family is yeah. extremely diverse. You know, my mom is Russian. My dad is Cuban. We lived in Cuba. I spent a lot of time in Russia. We then moved to Mexico and then we came to the U.S. So I for the, the things that I picked up from that is that my life on the one hand felt very lonely because I was an only child undergoing all of these really big changes in our family unit. Oh, yeah, and I, can imagine. I, I love my parents. My parents and I are very close, but it's not the same thing, right? Like you're a <laughs> child, you want like, you, you don't, you know, you have your people. And so I didn't have yeah. siblings. And to me, that was something that really stood out at a very young age. And so I'm, I've always gathered people like I show up in places and I'm like okay who are going to be my people here because I don't have any so I need to figure that out I need to make make community I need to make you know family in that like kind of superficial kind of use of the term but I need to yeah. make people that are my people so for me that was always a really guiding part and I think immigrating especially immigrating multiple times and being from various cultures there was always yeah. for me a sense of otherness and a sense of newness right so I was yeah. never enough of a particular place so I always had to figure out my place in some per in some somewhere my whole life and I think when I was younger that was probably really challenging as I became an adult there are pieces of that that felt um, really wonderful and expansive and like an opportunity but in any scenario it definitely required it required mapping out social situations and figuring out how to create my tribe over and over and over and over again I love how you say it, you know, mapping out social situations. Yeah, so basically your relocations and number of like moving uh, like to different countries, to different places impacted you the way that you started looking for your people everywhere, right? Yeah. So actually it was like for, you know, a good purpose right now, right? <laughs> so you oh my gosh, <laughs> absolutely. Well, the and the funny part is, and when we talk about base, this will make more sense. But when I first moved to Miami, so I was living in New York and I moved to Miami 11 years ago. So 2012, 2012. And I wasn't sure... I'd moved around and, you know, I'd lived in many cities at this point. I've spent a lot of time in different countries, but I really wasn't sure if Miami was the place for me. And so I did what I always do. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to start things. I'm going to like yeah. build, build spaces that I feel really good in because this is a new city and a new community for me. And one of the things that I did, and this was in 2012, was with two friends of mine. Um, we started a series of community of Jeffersonian dinners. So we mm -hmm. did, a, it was quarterly, It's now it isn't happening anymore, but it happened for 
10 years. So we did a Jeffersonian series of dinners for 10 years in our, in our homes where we would invite people and we would do the Jeffersonian dinner kind of style of conversation. And it became what, like one of the top, top memories that I have of living in Miami has been that. And it's been right. one of the avenues. Yeah. Oh, but, but the conversations have been amazing, amazing. And I've developed, there are people who are my really close friends today that I met through these dinners, that they were strangers before we walked into that room. And now that we're building base, there's a very big through line around that type of dinner model and how we generate really substantive conversation at that kind of, at small parties. And small gatherings. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you have been always building these communities, this right? And first it was, yeah, just like for fun, right? Or just to meet your own people. And now it's actually all turned out into your own startup, right? That you are working on. This yeah. is amazing. So I think if you know, you say like that you need to love your job so you don't have to work. <laughs> so is it the same situation about you? So you really enjoy what you're doing. So basically, it's your like whole life experience. So you're living and working all together. And it's like pure pleasure for you. Of course, with some challenges, I believe. <laughs> of course, oh my gosh, of course, like the list of challenges is long, but yes, I think the the thing for me that made so much sense about base was not only that I was like, oh, I love this topic and I'm obviously very passionate about it, which like, yes, that's very true. And you rarely find somebody who's more passionate about small gatherings. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm happy to go into, but the thing that felt really amazing was that it was taking kind of what I did in this very like analog personal way, because I've been doing so much of it for so many years and extra and expanding it into this much bigger, much more expansive space that there would be no way for me to do on my own, right? Like adding the layer of technology, building an algorithm so that we put all of these theories to, into practice around how we're matching groups of people, which is both pulling from my academic background, pulling from my personal experience, pulling from my passions. It's yeah. honestly, it's a dream come true. Like, I don't know what could have been designed that would be both like, yes, you're doing the thing that you love, but you also get to do it in this completely bigger and more magical way than you could have ever dreamed. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's not only about your, you know, practice, your practical experience, right? That you're working with community, that you're gathering people, but also about your education. Yeah, can you just say a few words? Because I think it's really interesting because professionally, you're very well prepared and you probably should be well aware of the people's, you know, intentions, connections, everything, how is it structured, right? So tell me just a few words about your professional, uh, educational background. Of course. So my, I, what I studied originally was psychology and government. And I, I tried uh -huh. to combine the two because I was very interested in psychology, but not from an individual perspective. So like yeah, I yeah. wanted to study groups of people and that was the best way I could, I found to do that in college. Then uh -huh. I uncovered that, you know, thanks to a, a really, really incredible mentor that I had in college, who was like a father of the field. I uncovered that there's actually a field that does this. There's, it's called organizational psychology and it studies groups of people and group behavior. And so that's what I have my master's in. Um, and I, I like to joke that for me, psychology is a, a tool, right? It's a lens for the world that you don't have to practice it, you know, you don't have to be advising mm -hmm. anyone in that way for it to be something that changes how you think and how you view, you know, the like world around you as it happens. But for me, it was always about if it's one person, I'm like, all right, that's fine. Not that interested. If it's three people or more, <laughs> I'm like deeply fascinated. <laughs> so uh -huh. I've always been drawn to groups, including okay. academically. Okay, so this is super interesting. So you have a nice educational background, a lot of practice, so fascinating. And, you know, also before we... Um, we'll move to the base story. I also wanted to ask you about the Miami Tech Happy Hour because for me, I think this is a great recurrent event that all people related to tech know about. And I think for all newcomers who are moving to Miami or for other people who are coming to Miami just for a few days, everyone knows. And if you Google, you know, you can see this is Miami Tech Happy Hour. So when I came to Miami, this is the first thing I was aware of. Good. And I think, I'm, yeah, so you're doing a great job. So I'm impressed by these things that you're doing and like you're doing it with Chris, right? But so you, you said that uh, you moved to Miami, you started building your own things, this dinner series and also Miami Tech Happy Hour. So how did it happen? So why was Chris and like, what was the main idea why you started this? Just a few words. Sure. Um, so Miami Tech Happy Hour was actually, I think before then I worked on so many other different projects that I just yeah. cared for and loved for. Um, 
you know, the, the one that stands out to me most from when I moved here is that I started an organization called Awesome Foundation Miami that was mm -hmm. awarding, that continues to award micro grants to random ideas in the community. We just celebrated our 10 year anniversary. And nice. it's this like amazing, to me, when people ask me why I'm optimistic about Miami, it's honestly this, because you get to see random people from every corner of Miami care enough about something to apply for a micro grant to do it. So anyway, I feel like I've had very different perspectives on Miami. Um, um, and things that I've started that have made me feel really connected to the city. The mm -hmm. Miami Tech Happy Hour is a really big version of that. And it started actually during the pandemic. So before the pandemic, obviously oh. we know Miami changed. Yeah, it's very recent. It's been three, it's three years old. So before the pandemic, as we know, those of us who've lived here and you who are a relatively recent transplant, but I think have heard the story, yeah. Miami had you know, Miami changed a lot. We had an influx for of so sure. many people. You know, we were already building this tech community for years at that point, but it suddenly became really accelerated. Um, there were a lot of layers of the things that happened here during the pandemic. But prior to that, there had been so many events, so many gatherings, some of them good, some of them bad, as with any city, but there had been so many places of convening. And of course, during the pandemic, that wasn't the case. And so Chris and I, who we've been friends for a very long time, we've never really worked together, but we've really supported each other in our different ventures. And he and I both moved from New York. So we both knew a, a no. ton of people who were moving from New York. And he and I actually moved the same year. We just didn't know each other at the time. And so we had all of these people that we knew coming from New York and Chicago and San Francisco, and they didn't have anything to plug into because there were no events. Yeah. because this was 2020. And so what we started to do was do these very small gatherings that were like socially distant and like, let's invite, you know, 10 people so they can meet yeah. each other and they can, you know, just have a face, right? Like see, at that point, if yeah, you remember, exactly. it was so magical to see somebody and be like, oh my God, a person. So we started doing that. <laughs> and in my mind, this was not an event. I actively resisted this. Being oh, it was not. Okay. No. okay like, You're well. doing a very random occasional gathering for a very small people. It's like not a big deal. Nobody cares. It's fine. And that was very short lived because people really wanted us to do it more and they wanted us to keep going and do it more frequently. And then at a certain point, I kind of lost the battle of the non-eventing because we yeah. had this very large one that was like 450 people. And I was like, okay, yeah. it is event. And so then from there, it just became more formalized. Uh, and, you know, from there, we like switch locations. Now mm -hmm. it's, you know, hundreds of people every week. Yeah. The yeah. yeah the news for a minute. Yeah. You have like more than 150 people every Thursday, right? Oh, every all Thursday. the time. No, no, all the time. Like now it varies because it changes depending on if it's a sponsored evening or not, but it's huge. Um, the mailing list is over 8,000 people. So like it's, it's a lot of people in the community. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because typically during the pandemic times, people didn't have events. They didn't plan something related to events because we yeah. were all locked at home. But you actually started the best tech event during the pandemic times. What's wrong with you? You yeah, know, it's it was very counterintuitive. I mean, it's also Miami. Miami was such like a wild place in the time in the COVID life. So, it, you know, people, there weren't a lot of other events happening. We, we, during the beginning, we tried to keep it small. And then especially after kind of people started to become vaccinated, it became this like much bigger, much bigger yeah. thing. Uh, the first big one that we had was right after people actually got vaccinated. And you could just... <laughs> you could tell that there was this like relief and like hunger for yeah. seeing other people in person. Like people were just hugging and so excited to see each other and they hadn't seen each other in like a year and a half. And it was this yeah. wonderful mix of this. The thing I think that has made the happy hour stand out is that it has been a mix of people who are new and people who are old to Miami. And mm -hmm. there, there have been moments of tension between these communities. And especially at the beginning, people who were new to Miami weren't really integrating with people who were re, you know, originally from Miami or yeah. have been here for longer. So I think what made us feel very welcoming and very cozy for people was that we were very much one foot in each world. And so it mm -hmm. always felt authentic, I think, to the larger Miami story. Yeah. And so and again, does. combining different words, you see, so not all different nationalities, different words. Always, always, yeah. always. Yeah. Oh, that's, 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 my, <laughs> that's my happiest place. When I manage to combine things that don't exactly make sense or like they make sense in my mind <laughs> and they work in the real world, that's my happiest place. Yeah. Yeah. So one more question about Miami and we will go to the base story. So. How would you describe this Miami tech ecosystem? Because, you know, 
a lot of people are talking about it. Like when I go to different events, people ask me, okay, do you think I should relocate to Miami or not from different mm -hmm. cities, you know, because, you know, everyone hears about this growing tech hub. So how would you describe this tech ecosystem and what are these trends and what is lacking in your opinion as an experienced gatherer in Miami? Sure. I mean, I think we've changed. So I've lived here for 11 years and I definitely, all of them involved in the tech ecosystem and yeah. it has changed dramatically. Um, it has changed as the city has changed, but also the ecosystem has changed in a way that I really respect because although I have many complaints and many concerns, which I uh -huh. always voice very actively, I think it's, for me, it's been really inspiring to see how much growth and how much change and how much maturity it has happened because I think that that's pretty remarkable. And I don't know, I don't know if every city can do that. So in terms of the things that have been amazing, I just, I think our ecosystem has matured across everything. So the investor kind of community and the investor conversation is yeah. could not could not be more different today than it was 10 years ago, where there was such a short investor bench. Most people were not equipped to do venture investing, right? They were mm -hmm. coming from the real estate sector. Sure. There was a huge education gap. Uh, the term sheets that you saw in Miami were like, you thought that they were like in Latin America yeah. in like 20, 10 years ago. It just like, you know, not because they were necessarily predatory, but just because people didn't like know. And, and yeah. there was also not a lot of funding. So founders didn't have a lot of opportunity to like really negotiate that. So I would say our investor community has matured dramatically. There's obviously room to grow, but it's been amazing. Our I would also say our connection with Latin America has become a lot more innovation focused, right? We've always been this really interesting kind of Hong Kong of the hemisphere yeah. where there is yeah. this kind of pathway in both directions, but a lot of it has been around corporate or trade or logistics. It hasn't been around innovation and tech yeah, in, exactly. the, in the way that we now think about it, um, especially not around investment. And so I think our relationship with the region has matured still has a lot of ways to go, but has matured a lot. Um, our founder conversations, right? Like the, the, the founder community has up leveled a ton. Right. Like we used to have, you know, people I respect entrepreneurs of any kind in any journey, but it was definitely we were very young and we were very immature yeah. and ideas were not kind of being developed. And like the bar was low and some things were very mediocre because there just wasn't that kind of environment to really foster that yeah. really strongly. And now I think we have some incredible talent and incredible founders and people building really incredible, viable, scalable companies. So, yeah. I think there's been a lot that has changed in terms of what remains to change or what I think is important. Yeah. I'll kind of keep it brief. So one, I think we still like we still have gaps in terms of I think we have, we're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table in terms of industry verticals that Miami could really shine in. Right. Mm -hmm. There are, are, you know, we're very good in certain things, but there are industries that make so much sense here that if we need to, I think we need to kind of concentrate and invest in and and try to attract more talent and more innovation around those spaces. So to me, I mean, climate tech and resilience and blue tech is obviously one of them, but yeah. I, and I think we are investing in that area, which is yeah, great. Yeah, it is growing, yeah. That one more is growing, and absolutely. But I think things like, for example, uh, FinTech, I expect mm -hmm. us to be much more of a FinTech hub than we are because we're such a financial hub, but we yeah. aren't. Or logistics tech or prop tech, like I, prop I would tech. expect us to be, one, I think, yeah. correct. Mm -hmm. I would expect us to be a prop tech and like construction tech and like IOT hub because of mm -hmm. how much we are a focus of real estate and construction, right? And yet we kind of aren't. So there's a couple of these verticals that I think we have to figure out what we want to do around them and how we want to be, a, you know, a regional or global player in this larger space. I think that's one. The other one is affordability, right? Like we're trying to figure out the talent conversation around how we have great talent and how we mature great talent. But Miami is a really difficult and unaffordable city in so many ways. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, it's difficult to mature and attract amazing talent if it's incredibly expensive for you to move your family here, right? Yeah, so, incredibly expensive. Sometimes even more expensive than California right now. You exactly. know, that's crazy. Yeah. And, it, and if you look at kind of, I think a lot also in terms of Latin America, because I'm very bullish on the region, and I think Latin America has some amazing innovation. So when I think about Miami wanting to be the soft landing place for all of these amazing Latin American entrepreneurs as they're thinking of expanding to the US or other markets, you, we can't ask these people to have like an insane startup cost to just move themselves or their family here. Like we're not gonna be the city that they choose. Um, and that's not even talking about like the other issues around affordability. But so I would say that thinking of 
what our identity is around innovation is one. And the other one is this like larger conversation about how are we a livable city in terms of affordability, infrastructure, public transit, climate change. Um, so those are my two big, like, what are we going to do about this <laughs> kind of place? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree with you that you know, these verticals, uh, affordability, I would also maybe add here more educational facilities. And I'm so super happy to see, you know, that Northeastern University started developing their campus there. So mm -hmm. kind of slowly, slowly changes. So I think it also matters. And that's amazing. Okay, and um, one more thing. So you are working with Chris and Miami Tech Happy Hour, and now at your startup at base, you are working with two male co-founders. So yeah. how do you feel about working with men? Like, what's your own experience? And like, do you choose it purposefully or is just, you know, accidentally happened? <laughs> So in this case, honestly, I think it was very accidental. Um, in fact, I think most of my other projects, I have been very female co-founder heavy. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. So I, I was not intentional, but it happened to coincide. And, and I actually think it's been a really, for me, a great learning and a great kind of tool and an interesting reflection. Um, first of all, because as individuals, all of these people are fantastic. And so working with all of them is has been amazing for me, especially because yeah. we're so different in some ways, not related to gender, but we're just so different yeah. in some ways that kind of the, the, the like articulation of those spaces is really fascinating. But I do think kind of there, there are elements around gender that are true, right? Around how people show up differently in the workplace, how people lead differently, how they make different assumptions around certain things. And I find I find it really interesting to be a woman in those contexts and also to mm -hmm. have male counterparts. I think we are infinitely enhanced by the presence of both genders together. For me, it has been absolutely an enhancement, I, I think, for yeah. them as well. This is amazing. And you've mentioned many times right now that it's all about diversity, right? And very often I hear that the best co-founders are those who are actually very different, you know, who have mm -hmm. different skills, different, uh, you know, features. And that what makes the team so strong. And you personally, what like advice do you have for, you know, aspiring founders when it comes to selecting the right co-founders? Because, you know, a lot of people, they're struggling with that. So what is your take here? Oh my gosh, I feel like this is a total, like a large conversation on its own, but another I, if podcast I, here. <laughs> that's another part, that's like another hour. But in terms of a couple of things, I, I agree with that. I think it's amazing. I think it's very important to know your weaknesses and be able to become comfortable with articulating them. That's all for me, that's always an area of growth. So I'm not saying that casually, but I do think it's important to know what are the things that you love and what are the things that you do not love and also what are the things that you are bad at and to mm -hmm. try to triangulate around each other's weaknesses, even more so than your strengths, right? Like, because that's where you can help each other catch the ball. Um, because And, you know, the startup journey is rough at times, right? It's complicated. Sure. It, you fail, you're confused, you're tired. And so like things are going to happen where you are not at your best. For sure. I know there are moments this year where I have been nowhere near my best. We trust you. And <laughs> nowhere near my best. And what's and what has been most important for me at least is been like witnessing these other people that are my team like fill the gaps of where I am at my worst. Right. And it's part of the most like intimate part of the fart founder experience, but it's really difficult. It, it's really difficult if you don't like think about that proactively. So I would say like filling your gaps and find like yeah. picking people that are good at the things that you're not and where you're building that camaraderie, I think is a big one. Um, and the other one I think is for me, it's picking people that are equally as passionate about the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were, so two of us for base, two of us were kind of matched with each other first and then we were trying to find our third co-founder mm -hmm. and we were talking with someone else who is not our current co-founder but we were talking with someone else and wonderful human super intelligent very competent but my read was this per this is not the thing that is this person's thing like mm -hmm. they would be excited to do this job they would be excited to think about this project but it's not this is not what keeps them up at night mm -hmm. and if you're gonna work together on something in this way it needs to all of us need to be crazy about this idea. It can't just be a job because, you know, or oh, I want to, I want to be a startup founder. So like, let me just pick a startup and do it. I don't yeah. feel like that works. You need to be equally committed to whatever the thing is you're trying to solve.
Yeah, I agree. It's all about the passion because if you don't have it, you will just give up, you know? So you don't want to find a co-founder that will right. just leave you in a couple of days, right? Because it's it's a hard journey, as you said it. That's absolutely true. And so... Could well, you and one thing I'll say to that, sure. just as like a side note, I think the, the, the added nuance to that is you don't just want someone who's coming on board to help you execute your vision because that's not mm -hmm. a co-founder. That's an employee, right? So like a co-founder sure. is a co-creator, right? So whatever your vision is, then needs to have flexibility enough to include one or two or however many people you are co-founding with. And it needs like, it needs to be a positive value add. It's an equal thing with diff you know, everyone has their own leg of the stool, but you're all building together. And so I think it's also important because sometimes people have a really great idea and they set about being like, well, I'm looking for a technical co-founder, right? Like I hear this all the time and, and I, I commend them on that, but I also think part of the mindset is wrong because what they're looking for is someone to execute on a thing that they've already decided about. Yeah. Yeah. And but that's not know, the same thing. Yeah, but 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 then it's even more harder, you know. Then it's even more harder to find a co-founder if you need someone who will co-create with you, you know. And I know that there are a lot of networking events, you know, like for finding your co-founder. So I believe in this case, you wouldn't find them useful, right? So I, I mean, mean I think hard. I think they're useful for showing up with an open mind for sure. I just I I the thing that I. I think is important is to remain that like re retain that sense of flexibility, right? Like none of us are ever going to be right a hundred percent of the time or have the 100% clarity of vision all of the time, right? Like I've had to adjust some of the things that I'm like, well, this is how I envision base, but I'm like, okay, I can be convinced otherwise, or I'm going to let go of some of these things because we have other priorities or they're going to come in later into the growth of the company, but not right now. Um, and I just, I think you want to, you want a relationship with, and you want to trust the people that you're bringing on. And I think the co-founder dynamic requires you to have that flexibility more so than if you're just hiring someone to develop a product that you've already yeah. thought of in your mind. Yeah. So, but you have three co-founders and I bet you do have some challenging situations or I would call them mm -hmm. conflicts. So yeah. what do you do about them? Because, you know, it's always like when we were kids and if you were like, you know, a group of three, there are always some conflicts when two of them, you know, think this way and you're the one who like disagree. Yeah. So how do you cope with that? You know, because sometimes it can be really, really hard. Yeah. I mean, I personally think that actually having three people has been amazing because you can kind of help each other move, right? If it's just two uh -huh. people and you disagree, you're just like everyone, you're just like at a standstill of you're, disagreement. Yeah, you got stuck, right? <laughs> but when you have three people, you can kind of triangulate a little bit differently. So it, I think that's been really helpful. The other thing is we try to be pretty vocal around like what we can concede on, right? Versus what is just like completely a non-negotiable, right? So because then something may be like, I just, I cannot compromise on this in my mind, yeah. but you can. So then you can compromise in my direction, but then vice versa. There may be something that I'm like, you know what? I feel strongly about this, but this is not, I'm not going to die on this hill. Like I can, mm -hmm. I can get behind this other vision or let's test it out. And I'm comfortable testing it out or mm -hmm. whatever other interim kind of compromise has to happen. I think we're pretty vocal about naming that. So usually we find a way through our disagreements, either by one of us kind of yielding a little bit to the one that feels most strongly about it. Uh, usually the third one kind of also triangulating a bit and kind mm -hmm. of creating a different space. Um, and also being very willing to test. Like one of the things that for us has worked is sometimes I'm like, I'm not, one of us is not convinced about something. And we're like, well, you know what, let's test it. Yeah. Like, let's see. And then we can have feedback as to whether or not it works or doesn't before we move forward with a larger commitment. That has actually been also very helpful. I think it's a super good tip. Yeah, just test it out. Yeah, see what happens. I mean, yeah, that, that that's super helpful. And I think another thing is that you have to be really transparent with each other, right? So you you just like, if you disagree, you just have all just sit together and like just say it, you know, throw it to your face and it just discuss it. So you don't have to play some, you know, hidden games that you're just communicating with one and the other co-founder, you know, is somewhere else. So you just have to be transparent and honest, right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so now let's talk about your startup more. So could you provide more insight into base? I was honestly super impressed when you started that. And I like see how you're growing. You have new team members. This is like amazing. And so basically base is a membership club, right? Facilitating curated social experiences through intelligent matching. 
So yes. how did it come into being? So you're a gatherer, right? Yeah, this is true. So but how did you move it to this next level that you decided to start the company? And, you know, there are so many different events like community building. It's like super burning right now. So what problem are you trying to solve, right? Oh, so um, exactly. Amazing question. Thank you. So <laughs> for us, so I would say the the three of us came at it from a little bit of a different perspective, but we ultimately mm. all converged on kind of base as a solution. The issue that we're trying to solve is kind of the lack of connection and depth that people are reporting, right? So historically, this is a particularly interesting moment because for decades, from like the psychology perspective, let's say like in academia, we have been talking about the erosion of community since 1970, probably. There's mm -hmm. several very famous research studies, very famous books that have been talking about how things that we kind of have a, so how we build community, some of it is in the US, but some of it is true globally, even if the trends you know differ, have some cultural differences. How we build community is has been breaking down for decades. But this is generally a conversation that has been happening in academic context as far as research. In the last couple of years, very much accelerated by COVID, work remote, you know, working remote, all of these other kind of things that are happening in terms of trend lines, we, we are suddenly seeing this decades long, very kind of isolated conversation from like academia and research centers colliding with the real human experience. So people are complaining that they don't feel connected. People, the loneliness epidemic kind of is happening around the world, but there's a lot of, you know, you don't have to be a person that identifies as lonely to have to report on a lot of these metrics. In the US, yeah. the US, you know, we, we like to measure everything. So we we like survey people constantly for everything. So we have so many interesting metrics here around the, the state, kind of what I would call the state of adult friendship, which is not good. <laughs> state of adult friendship. Uh-huh. Yeah. So like over 60% of American adults surveyed report not having made a single new friend in the last five years. Yeah. Which is a long time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, which is a long it. time. Yeah. Time. And there are some interesting trend lines around men, for example, versus women, people in urban settings versus people in more suburban and rural settings. But the overall trend lines are that people are feeling significantly less connected, significantly less in community and aren't mm -hmm. sure how to solve that. Right. So like they don't they don't feel connected or they feel lonely or they feel disconnected in some way, but they don't quite know how to articulate that in the best way possible, because most of the things that are happening are either digital. Right. Like we've never lived in a moment in time where people yeah. you we we are the most connected society that we've ever been. Right. In terms of sure. digital platforms. And yet people still feel this. Right. They still feel this gap. And so for us, what we wanted to solve for was how do we give people an avenue that is focused on depth and meaning to connect mm -hmm. with other people. So it's not about networking. It's not about transaction. Um, it's not about hobbies. It's about having like a, giving people a space to be bigger and deeper and more substantive humans, because we believe that everybody has that space um, in a way that actually leaves them surprised and delighted and deriving some sort of value, whether that value is friendship or an intellectual conversation or finding their community in a different city or dating or whatever you know, whatever the thing is, because people have different second order needs for why they come to base. All mm -hmm. of our members are here because they're looking for spaces to have more substantive and meaningful connection. So the way yeah. that we do that through the algorithm that we're developing that is learning over time and is based on a lot of theories around how we create groups, because groups, and I'll pause for a second after this, but groups are really interesting. And they're for me, a much more fascinating dynamic than one on one interactions. Because yeah. you've seen a lot of these communities that try to match you one on one, right? They like connect you with another person or you go to like coffee with another person. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the one on one interaction is very risky. Because if you do not like that person, or if you have a point of disagreement with that person, it's just you and them. Yeah. In small groups, there are some interesting dynamics, which have like psychological reasons, but there's some interesting dynamics that happen where number one, like it doesn't like the effect of polarities becomes less, it becomes softened. So if there's someone yeah. in the group that you don't like, it doesn't ruin your experience because there are these other seven people that you can interact Are with. sure. If there's someone that you're like, oh my God, I disagree with this person dramatically on politics or whatever doesn't ruin your experience because there are these other people that you're also having a conversation with. Yeah, exactly. So 
the, the edges, like the rough edges of human interaction become softened in small groups. And so what research shows is that people are more likely to even be vulnerable in small groups more than in one-on-one -on -one interactions. And so that's what we're so that's what we're trying to match for. We match people with intimate, interesting, and surprising experiences. So we match for the group, and then we curate the actual experience. So you're not just meeting at a table or at a dinner or at a, at a gallery to talk about your day, but you're actually being guided through a member moderated but really interesting dialogue. So hopefully you walk out being like, I would never have met these people. I'm so happy I did. And what an unusual and unique conversation that I normally wouldn't have had. Yeah, I think I think what's really important is meaningful conversations because, for example, yeah, I do a lot of events as well. And when you go to events, typically, very often, you just do not have enough time even, you know, to dive deeper into each person. So you basically just introduce yourself, you know, exchange a couple of words and that's it. So when it comes to some deep conversations, you don't have them. And sometimes you can think that, oh, this person is like, you know, kind of my person. But then when you start talking deeper, you understand that actually it's not. Or sometimes you just don't see really good people that can be your potential, you know, best friend. But you just do not see them because you didn't have time. Right. Yeah. So in this way, I guess you're really working on this gap, you know, to to have nice conversation, interesting conversation, not just fast food, you know, but really deep and meaningful. So this is this is really amazing. But I mean how can you actually join base right so if you feel lonely or if you feel like you want to be a part of this so how do you invite people how you make them join you know how does this yeah. process work is there a membership fee or how can you be a part of this yeah so i will say kind of i'll make one comment and then i'll answer that directly so one of the things that i've most enjoyed is building this extremely diverse community so age-wise, industry-wise. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, our, I think our youngest member is 22, our oldest member is 75. So like, oh, it's wow. extremely diverse. Yeah, it's <laughs> very diverse. People come for all sorts of reasons, right? They come because they're yeah. new to Miami and they want to find their tribe. They come because they have a community, but they want to have very different conversations. They want to meet new people. Um, it's just the, like the motivations are all similar, but different. And I think that that is a really beautiful, like, cornucopia of reasons. Um, in terms of how to join, so the process I hope is pretty simple. The idea of we're definitely, <laughs> we're selective, but I'm like, I hope we're selective about the community for sure. We're, we curate yeah. it very intentionally, but the idea is to be selective, but not exclusive. So the goal as most membership communities, I feel like, you know, there's something about it that is meant to be if you are not this, you cannot join, right? Like you either, yeah. if you don't have this pedigree or you don't have this focus yeah. or you don't have or this whatever. Like executive, whatever, right? All right. Yeah. Then like they're, they're somewhat defined by the thing that like you are not, right? So our hope is never to do that. So that is not how we define it. We, but we do kind of curate for people that are interesting themselves and also interested in other people. So the through lines for our community are people that, are passionate about something. They're either working mm -hmm. on something they're deeply passionate about, or they're passionate about other topics. They are they excel at something in their lives, and they're very curious and very interested. Not just interesting, mm -hmm. but interested. So mm -hmm. the application is: you go online to base.club. There mm -hmm. is a brief application that you fill out. You then get invited to an interview, and from there, there's a process oh, by which mm -hmm. yeah, brief. It's a brief interview and it's bi-directional. So our hope is that we ask you some questions, you ask us some questions. So like you also get to assess if BASE is a community that could work for you. Um, uh -huh. And then from there, if you're selected to be a member, you get invited to join. But if not, so if you're not selected, you said you don't just say no because of some reasons, does it mean that maybe there is no a good group for you right now, but potentially in the future, you could like get this invitation or how does it work? It, it depends because sometimes yes, depending, because we do try to like, the matching is such an important component that I, you know, when we are larger, we're going to have, we have a cap in each city, but let's say when we are larger in Miami, there may be different communities and different types, possibilities for matching different types of people that we may not have year one, right? That we may mm -hmm. have year three. So absolutely. Um, I also, I don't believe that everyone is a good base member. And sometimes you can tell them mm -hmm. from an interview, right? Like if people are extremely arrogant, for example, that's not, mm -hmm. you know, that's not, a, think of a person you would invite to a dinner party and a person you don't want to invite to a dinner party, right? That's like yeah, a very a really good example. Yeah. A working example. That's a uh -huh. kind of a, a oversimplification, but there are people that you're like, this is not a matter of time. 
Like, I just don't think that you would be a good member in this community because yeah. you're either looking for something very specific, right? Like if people yeah. want to use base to promote their business, this, that's not yeah, what this community is about, want, probably, right? Yeah. Or if people want to use base to f date, I'm like, you, you can find amazing people that you may want to date. But if that's your singular focus, that's not what this community is about, right? So if you're showing up from a place of taking in mm -hmm. the first five minutes that we meet you, that's, it's, it's probably not a matter of time. It's just probably a matter of like, you're not a good, we don't believe that you're a good fit for a community. And it's um, more about giving as well, right? Not only taking yeah. and using. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Because many dinners, people walk out. We actually, we had a member who is a, is an executive at a fortune 100 company who said that her, the base dinners that she's attended are some of the best networking events she's ever been to precisely mm. because they are not networking events. <laughs> So she doesn't uh -huh. half the time. She's like, I don't even know what these people do for a living, but I feel so connected to them that I want to help. I am rooting for their success. And so when we reach out to each other to help each other, to ask a question or to ask for advice or mentorship yeah. or connection, I'm so willing to do it because I'm so invested in them as humans because I didn't even know what they did for a living. And then it turned out that they did something that I could potentially help them with. So mm -hmm. there's something really beautiful about that. Um, and so, yeah, it's a membership model. Um, it's a hundred dollars a month. And then on top of mm -hmm. that, people pay, there's things that are included complimentary in your membership. There are events every month that are included in that. And then the dinner is paid for separately a la carte. Uh, and most members attend one dinner a month, but if they choose to attend more, we can match them to more. Uh-huh. Exciting. Great. So yeah, it's, it's a pretty great feedback, you know, from the fortune 500 executives. Yeah. Sounds, yeah. sounds really interesting, you know, and, um, yeah, I guess it's very, a curated group it's very interesting that you have to apply you know so i guess it gets more and more attractive with every step but uh so who are your competitors if we think you know if we look at the market from this perspective right so who are your competitors who can you compete with like for me the first example that comes to my mind is also like chief you know like um paid membership community so what are the differences mm -hmm. between you and them for example Sure. So I think most of these entities we see as very like indirect competitors. So something like a chief, mm -hmm. the, the obvious differences, and there's other examples like this, right? But the obvious differences is that they're built on affinity, right? So there are many membership communities that are built on a point of affinity. Either we share the same gender, in the case of chief, right? It's gender and kind of, you know, gender senior and Right. It's yeah. it's gender and seniority or mm -hmm. there are communities that are about, you know, uh, academic affiliations. Right. So we all went to the same school. We belong to this community together or yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. or angel communities. Right. Like we're all angel investors. So we're in this group because we're all angel investors and therefore we're in this community together. Nothing wrong with that. I think affinity organizations serve their purpose and are really great. We are the opposite. We are an organization based on and Trump, no pun intended, but and trying to serve you spaces of plurality. So I would say that that's one of the big differences in terms of some other communities like, you know, a Soho house or, you know, like membership clubs that have a physical structure. We don't have a yeah. physical structure. Right. So that's the most salient difference. We work with a lot of different partners, a lot of different experiences. Um, it's just it's a very different model because it's not bound to place. It's bound to experience and connection. So it's easier for us also to pair you, for example, if you're traveling to another city. So imagine some years from now, we have base in other cities and other communities. You're a base member in Miami. You're going to Paris for a conference mm -hmm. and you would like to join a base dinner in Paris and yeah. have a very different experience of this other city. For us, that's a very easy thing to do in our in our structure and even now well not today because we don't have these communities but eventually it would be very easy to do so there's like a there's meant to be a global nature to it and kind of a mm. connectivity nature to it that is hopefully mm -hmm. enhances people's experiences in their city as well as when they travel to other communities yeah so you have plans to expand like even globally but right now oh. are you in miami only or in some other cities in the states no, we are only Miami because we launched this year. So this is our big kind of pilot and test year. Uh, we're planning our expansion next year. So hopefully, you know, the plan is next year is cities two and three. And who knows if those go really well, maybe beyond that. But at a minimum, two and three. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I personally have gone through your application process. So hopefully <laughs> I'll have an interview <laughs> to be able to experience it myself. But, you know, Good. I found some questions really interesting. For example, 
who is your dream guest? And you know, it made me think a lot. So, and I wanted to ask you the same question because you've gathered so many different groups. Is there a person that you would like to meet or invite to the party? Like, who is this person? Oh my goodness. So my answers are very varied for this. Kind of depends okay. on how I feel. There are some days where I feel like I would want to invite my grandparents for dinner. Because, <laughs> okay. you know, I got, I knew my grandparents when I was younger and I didn't get to know them as this, this much of an adult. And I would love to have very different conversations today than I ever did. So sometimes that's my answer. Other times it's like interesting women leaders in history, right? Like I would love to... I don't know, have Queen Elizabeth II to dinner oh, yeah. or like, I don't know, Golda Meir or like there's just these really remarkable global, you know, I think a lot in like politics because I'm really interested in politics and history. So kind of global leaders of that mm -hmm. kind of ilk, I think would be really fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I can think of many. I mean, I'm a big literature buff. So half like half of like Russia's like writers, I would love to <laughs> work for dinner. So, you know. Uh, it depends yeah. on the day. Yeah, yeah, no, but anyways, the question is really interesting. Another one is also like, what are the top three words friends might use to describe you? And you know, the questions seem simple, but at the same time, they're really, really interesting. So yeah. what about you? So how do your friends describe you usually using three adjectives? Oh my goodness. I think uh -huh. we would say kind. Uh-huh, kind, okay, that's nice. Um... like high energy so like jovial not high energy yeah. jovial because i feel like i'm a very happy person so i think it would say kind <laughs> yeah that, i think it would say kind jovial and organized organized oh this is that uh, that was unexpected but yeah i mean yeah. well <laughs> yeah, because i for sure <laughs> i most most of my friends we've had you know recurring versions of me yeah. being in charge of things right like me being in charge of some sort of you know yeah i just I'm can say this this meeting that you host at your house usually you get the calendar invite and ahead of time you know the Correct. host you know what to bring you know like if there are any costs or whatever so everything is very structured you have Correct. reminders yeah so yeah and and that's actually make you know like working with you or having something with you much easier when you're structured mm -hmm. and organized. So good for you. <laughs> That's well, I really think it's good what allowed job. me to build all of these communities, right? Like I've built different, you know, like communities with over the years around very different topics that I've really enjoyed. And part of what makes it manageable to have to do them and then, you know, to eventually hand them off because now most of those are managed by other people. Um, which is a great relief to me, is that there is a system. There's like a structure to it. It's not just kind of random. Exactly. There's a there's some basic yeah. process for it, um, even if it's not extremely complicated. So yes, I think they would say that I am very organized and methodical. Yeah, and of course, like I, I would love to ask you like 10 more questions, but we are wrapping up slowly. So my last question to you would be about fundraising tips because you are, you know, like you just started your career journey as a startup co-founder. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's not hard to fundraise. A lot of startups, they complain about that, that how hard, yeah. the time were challenging. So you just have recently raised like a great amount of money. So how was it for you? And what tips like could you do to other founders, startup founders, how to fundraise better, faster, easier? I don't know where to look at. So what is your take here? Yeah. I mean, I think so fundraising is always difficult and that we are definitely living through an additionally difficult time. This yeah, is, you know, <laughs> this is a, a winter of fundraising. So it is definitely a challenging time to fundraise well, sure. um, and after the pandemic and after the last couple of kind of bubbles in crypto and kind of at Web3, yeah. there's definitely investors are being a lot more hesitant, a lot more mindful about when they invest, what they invest in. So I think part of my, I guess part of my advice is on the one hand, I, I think it's being realistic you know, it's bold, but realistic because we, we went through a phase, you know, some years ago where we were not so much on the realism train. People were just pitching random outlandish ideas that they had never tested yeah. with, with no data and no information and no proof whatsoever of any traction. And investors were inve investing money in that because it seemed exciting and interesting. We are yeah. 
extremely past those days, right? Like that is not where we are. And so the conversations oh, sure. I think that people, that investors value is when you're deeply passionate about your work and obviously you deeply believe in your product, but you're not delusional, right? And so yeah. showcasing what you think is realistic, you know, what traction you already have, what you think is an actual access, like accessible amount of growth for whatever it is that you're doing. Um, just landing it in the real world, I think is really important because we are not in the days where it was fine to just be flying around saying things that kind of make sense, but not really. So I would say landing it in the real world is big. Um, I also think investors often are looking, you know, it's a chicken and egg situation, right? So it's hard because so many founders need money in order to start their company, but investors want metrics in order to know that your company is viable, right? So like yeah. the dance between what you can do to get started at least enough to mm -hmm. have something to show, I think is really critical. It's one of the things that really helped us um, because we started very much somewhat thinking like, okay, we're either going to do this or it's going to completely fail. So we'll see what happens. And then thankfully it's what allowed us to really convince investors because our first you know, the, a lot of the doubts or the questions that they had around a B2C company that was community driven. Are people going to pay for this? Are people going to do this? We yeah. could solve them very, we could answer them very quickly within the first month because we had membership, paying members, people going to dinners, people reviewing dinners, like all of the things that they were worried about, we now had answers to. Mm -hmm. um, but it was definitely a risk for us. It was a big risk to launch something without having actually fundraised for it. But it's yeah, also yeah. what led us, what allowed us to fundraise for it. So, you know, I think it's a it's can be an awkward dance trying to figure that out. Um, and the last thing I would say is to really leverage founder communities. Right. I think investor outreach, especially cold outreach, is so yeah, challenging. That was my next question. You know, just cold outreach so versus warm intros. Challenging. Right. I think I think the cold outreach can sometimes work, but wow, is it challenging. Right. I do think that the warm intros are very powerful and especially from founders in their portfolio, right? Like if I, if I'm an investor and a founder I've invested in and I've built a relationship with recommends a company for me to look at, even if I don't invest in them, that's, that's that there's something there that they probably think is worth me looking at and they think is a fit. And so I do think that the, like figuring out ways of having warm introductions in this space is really important. It's obviously very challenging because it's a very selective community. And so that can be really difficult for people who don't have that network. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, big reasons why, you know, women, minority groups, like uh, other communities need a lot more help building that social capital because mm -hmm. this is still very relevant in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. And also like a little, a little follow up question here. So when you fundraise, when you were pitching in front of investors, so who was the one to do it? What is more about you or about your male founders? Because sometimes, you know, I get a lot of questions from female founders like, oh, you know, investors don't listen to me. But when I have my male co-founder, the situation changes. Is it true for you or like how did it work for you? So I think for us, it would be very difficult for me to assess that because so Kaben as our CEO was leading yeah. the funding round, mm -hmm. right? So every every first conversation was with Kaben. And mm -hmm. then the second conversations with every investor depended on the investor. So if they were more interested in understanding kind of the intricacies of the product and the technology and how we were going to mm -hmm. build the technology, those calls were Kevin and Ricardo. If they were not and they were interested in the rest of what we were doing and why we were doing it, then it was Kevin and me. So I think we made decisions based on our strengths more than our gender, I would say. But we also like Kevin was the face of fundraising because he's our CEO. So yeah, we didn't make sense. We, totally. we don't have I don't have a lot of other metrics <laughs> to, to showcase against that. Um, I really enjoyed the conversations that I I mean, I participated in many of them. So I really enjoyed mm -hmm. them. And I think, you know, the dynamic that Kevin and I have for me worked really well because we answer questions very differently. So when we're well prepared, the tag team that we have, I think, is really well received. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we focused on that kind of on, on really like dancing together in how we pitched with each of our strengths. Yeah. I honestly believe that you have a very beautiful match in your team that is diverse in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of everything experience. So I wish you like good luck and I encourage everyone after this, you know, 
great conversation to check your website, to learn a little bit more about days, especially if you're planning to expand more and explore yeah. new cities. I'm honestly like thrilled about that. Yeah. We have and wait lists. We have current wait lists for a bunch of cities that are on the that are on the docket for next year. So even if people don't live in Miami, they can absolutely get on the wait list for other cities already. Okay, so this is exciting. So that's what probably they should do. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, that was really, really interesting to learn more about days. And I hope that you will, you know, expand more, have more wonderful clients, people, thank and you. that your community will strive. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I hope so too. Thank you. Later. You too. Happy Monday. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. bye.